Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala. Um, Insha'Allah, in this live, I don't want to take um, questions, I don't want to take questions in this live. Um, but I want to hear from you, um, brothers and sisters. I want to hear from you, brothers and sisters, what you think are pressing topics that uh, need to be spoken about. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that the thing which this, uh, when, and I'm going to turn off the comments just while I'm saying this, whenever I talk about pressing uh, topics or whenever I speak about topics which need to be addressed, I want you to forever, always and forever take it as a given and take it as something which is uh, an unwritten law that the number one thing which we are in need of speaking about is the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the central point and the central pillar of our existence and the central pillar of this world and the next is speaking about the oneness of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala and this is the thing that we are most in need of okay we are most in need of learning about the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you who believe, aminu. Allah says, O you who believe, believe in Allah and His Messenger. This is an evidence, ikhwani fillah, that we believe but we are still in need of increasing our faith and increasing our study of the Tawheed of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah is addressing the believers and telling them to believe. And that is an evidence that we are in need of constantly coming back to the Tawheed of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You might hear me talking about drugs. You might hear me talking about uh, sex. You might hear me talking about jobs you might hear me talking about crime you might hear me talking about these other issues take it as a given and an unspoken that the most important thing that we need to speak about is the tawheed of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is something which inshallah in all of my khutbas in all of my speeches whether i'm in the masjid or whether i'm delivering a talk or wherever it is you'll always find me bi'idhnillahi ta'ala bi'idhnillahi kareem and by the grace of allah I'll always try and bring it back to this because this is this is the key. This is the key ultimately. If I want goodness for you, I'm going to teach you about something which is going to make you prosper in this world and the next. And the thing which is going to make you prosper in this world and in the next is Tawheed. I can teach you about good manners, but if I don't teach you about Tawheed, I'm useless. Because you can be calling upon others and committing shirk and those good manners are going to be thrown back in your face on your qiyamah. You had good manners with the creation, you had the filthiest of manners between you and Allah and you associated partners with Him, etc, etc. So always take it. And this is an introduction to, we're going to speak about other things and these other things they do have a position that we need to speak about them. But speaking about Tawheed is number one. And it is the first thing, the first thing that we go back to your heart is hurting, you're in, you're in anxiety, etc. Go back and learn about Tawheed. Go back and read about Tawheed. Go back and speak about Tawheed. I promise you there's nothing sweeter than that. Barakallah feekum. Okay? So having said that, um, inshallah, if you guys want to uh, speak about or if you want to type and suggest uh, a topic that you think um, I should just have a few minutes addressing bi'idhnillah al-kareem, then... Um, then we can do that bi-idhnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. So go ahead, uh, brothers or sisters. Go ahead, inshallah. Go ahead. If you guys have anything and something which I think that... Um, okay, so the brother, he got in there first. He mentioned speaking about university and student loans. 
There's no way to sugarcoat it. Student loans are haram and student loans that we have in, in, in England, they are riba based loans and a fatwa from Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad or this mufti or that mufti doesn't change the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are haram, they are forbidden to take, they're forbidden to use and they come under riba. Riba is a very serious thing and I don't want to mention cer certain parts of it but it's very very serious. It's, it's a major sin from the major sins of Al-Islam. Allah says that if you don't give up this riba then take notice of a war against Allah and his messenger. Some of the scholars of tafsir including some of the companions they said that this means that the person who deals and takes and, and, and deals with riba he's going to be given weapons on the day of judgment on the day of judgment he's going to be given weapons and then he's going to be told go and fight against allah go and fight against allah allah mustaan so it's a serious issue the thing that i want to say to you brothers and sisters okay is that in my mind now i think the educational system that we have today is a single track failing system what do i mean by that everybody is just pushed through the same funnel everybody is pushed through the same way and everybody thinks that this is the way that i'm going to obtain success when in reality it isn't okay you're going to go to uni i think what are the uni fees now nine thousand pounds or something like this per is it nine thousand a year something like this and you're going to go to university and after three years let's say you're going to come out with close to £30,000 worth of debt. £30,000 worth of debt. Okay. And as a Muslim, we know that the debt, it holds a person back. And you're going to come out with this much debt. Debt which you fell into as a result of dealing in interest and dealing in riba. And in my opinion, and I go as far as saying as some of... Uh, one of the mashaykh he came, I think it was Sheikh uh, Badr ibn Ali al Utaybi, Hafidhullah ta'ala. He said that this is a weakness in a person's tawheed, or it was another one of the mashaykh. He said that this is a weakness in a person's tawheed. And he was uh, answering the question about mortgages. And it's the same thing because people say, Brother, we have to have a university degree. People say, Brother, we have to have a mortgage. It's as if what you're saying to Allah is, Oh Allah, you have clo closed all of the doors to halal rizq. You have closed all of the doors of halal upon me and I've been forced to go into haram. Think about that. Do you feel safe? Do you feel okay meeting Allah on Yom al Qiyamah with that attitude? It's as if you're saying that there is nothing left for me except to take the haram. Oh Allah, you closed all of the doors to halal and you left me just the door of haram. What are you saying about your Lord, tabaraka wa ta'ala? That's the first thing. The second thing, I and I don't I mean no disrespect to anybody who went to uni and, and I don't mean I'm not speaking about anybody in particular, but the caliber of people emerging from university is absolutely atrocious. You can have a university graduate who is thick. And there's no other word I can think about right now. He is thick. He has studied and he spent that money and he's supposed to be intelligent, but he's thick. He has no uh, people skills. He has no communication skills. He has no common sense, can't think on his feet. He's not resourceful. As somebody who would employ, I would give precedence to a person who is uh, an active thinker and is resourceful. A million times over somebody who had a degree, just a piece of paper, but he didn't have this up here. From a practical perspective, brothers and sisters, the job market is saturated. There are, uh, there are um, graduates flipping burgers in McDonald's and there's nothing wrong with flipping burgers. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is they went to uni, incurred all of that debt. And as the, after the end of it, they came out and got a mediocre job, which didn't require the degree. 
because the because the 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 market the currency the 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 current economy is is really suffering as a result of all those idiots who voted for brexit and all of that stuff it's really going down and so there are many graduates fighting for just a few jobs and so yes whilst i recognize at the same time okay that you may want to go into medicine you may want to become a pharmacist you may want to become a heart surgeon etc you can't achieve that except by going to university but you have to at the same time understand this that the end goal is not going to promise you happiness it's not going to promise you money you're going to go into you know people think oh i want to I, I'm, I'm 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 doing medicine at at uni you say well, Mashallah, good for you. What, do you want me to be happy for you? You're doing some crazy long degree. You're going to come out with X amount of debt at the end of it unless you have, uh, you know, a job or you have a business or you have parents who are fundraising, you know, bankrolling you. You're going to come out with X amount of debt at the end of it. Then you're going to go and you're going to become a junior doctor and you're going to be working stupid hours and you're going to be spoken to like the trash of the earth by the seniors above you. And then you're going to, after having done I don't know how many, how long of that, then you're going to go and specialize in a particular field. Boy, by the time you're earning a decent wage and something which, you know, everybody wants to from the medic, you might be 35, 40 years old and then you're going to be in X amount of debt. It's not enviable. Don't think that this is something which is necessarily good. I'm not knocking it, but at the same time, it's not it's not all hunky dory. That's the thing that I'm trying to get people to see here. Likewise, when it comes to university, Ikhwani Fillah. Don't please, please don't fall into uh, the haram and such a grave sin. Don't fall into it and think that your your risk is, is 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 limited to this paper. Subhanallah, your risk is written, and if you run from it, it's gonna find you, and you won't die until you've received every penny that has been written towards your name. And if you chase after it, you won't receive any more than what was already written for you in the first place. I know we have to be practical. I know that we have to have skills. But you need to see that there's things like apprenticeships and vocational courses and part-time degrees, distance learning. There are ways out, walhamdulillah. Okay? And so the doors of halal are not closed that we have to go to the doors of great haram. And that's all I want to say on that topic, barakallahu feekum. But look, brothers and sisters, please. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَا Whoever fears Allah, Allah will give him a way out. And for you people who want money, وَيَرْزُقُّ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And Allah will give him risk from where he could never have imagined. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And whoever has tawakkul in Allah, فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be sufficient for him. خلاص, that's all you need to know. If you believe, if you believe, if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, then follow those steps there. You have taqwa of Allah, Allah will give you a way out and he will give you rizq from where you didn't even know. And if you have tawakkul, Allah will suffice you in every single uh, situation. Khalas, ikhwani fillah, that's it now. The, the blueprint is there, now me and you just have to accept it and we have to believe. And this is a test of then iman. It's nothing more than a test of iman. Allah has told us, do we believe it? Well now, there's the acid test. Barakallahu feekum. Um, so... Uh, that was the issue of student loans and university. Um, we've spoken about that issue. If you guys have any other issues that you think are uh, you want to speak about, uh, then then inshallah go ahead. So uh, for anybody who is uh, new, then I want to speak about these practical practical issues. Um, so we've spoken about university and the student loan. And you can throw mortgage in there as well, okay? Um, um, so um, that's that's that, okay? Um, let's let's talk about a different issue. Um, let's talk about a, 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 an unrelated issue, inshallah. Um, and that is the issue which I want to speak about, um, which is the disconnect between the Malvi class in inverted commas, and the non-practicing people. You see, you, you brothers and sisters uh, here, you are sitting here, you're relatively rare people in the sense that you maybe follow me or you've seen some videos or you've prayed behind me somewhere uh, or, uh, you, you know, you've, you've, you, you have some 
something in your heart, Yani, which you you have this love of Islam, where you can sit and listen to a Mulvi talk about Al Islam. Okay, the disconnect, and so I am talking to the I'm preaching to the converted in inverted commas. I'm preaching to the converted. The issue is that there is a disconnect. The people who I want to be speaking to, there's a disconnect. These are people who don't come to the masjid because they think that Islam doesn't have the answers to them. They are people who uh, won't come and uh, you know follow me on Instagram, whatever, because they're following other people or they're not going to follow me on Facebook, whatever it might be. They're not going to go on YouTube and search up for anything remotely Islamic. Okay? And... They are people, they are people who, who are where I was, let's say, 15 years ago. So they are people who, who are in a position today where I was back then. And the thing is, they are the ones who are most in need of this. And you know, the thing is, brothers and sisters, this is where I need you guys. Because I can't necessarily, because I, of the way I look or because of the way that I speak... I can't necessarily approach these people, but these people might be your friend, they might be your younger brother, they might be your neighbor, they might be your cousin, they might be somebody you see at the gym, they might be somebody that you work with. And this is where we have to, as Allah says, cooperate in righteousness and piety. That you hear something from me, you take it back to them. You hear something and you develop it and you, you put it in your own words and you give it to that person. Because Wallahi, you, you won't. Uh, believe the effect that your words can have on another person and there might be a young man or a young sister who is just on the on the edge and you speak some words and alhamdulillah like that was the motivation that they needed to start practicing and so this is where you guys should never ever ever uh, diminish and demean your position fine it comes from me and it goes to you guys, but you guys need to pass it on. And this is like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in his farewell hajj, in his farewell sermon, that let those who are present, let them pass it on to those who are not present. For perhaps the one who listens to it, he understands it better than the one who spoke it. Isn't this the case, subhanAllah, where sometimes a teacher will be teaching something and the student understands it better than the teacher. Or the one who is listening, he gets more of a grasp than the one who is teaching it to him. Or the one that's mentioning it. That's where you brothers and sisters are uh, really important. There's a disconnect between me and the boys on the street. The gangsters. There's a disconnect between us. But you guys, and I know some of you, will have their ear better than I do and so what I need from you not because it, I don't get any money I don't get any benefit what I need from you is I need you guys to go and pass this message on I need you guys to go and show that you know what the Molvi class some of them do care but they just don't know how to get through to you guys because you don't come to the masjid they can't come out to the clubs and they can't come out to the shisha cafes and the bars so how are they going to get to you they can't come out to these uh, venues etc which is not permissible to go to so yani you know we need you to bring these people in bring them in for the jumu'ah khutbah bring them into the talks bring them into these types of things give them talks send them the link whatever on whatsapp you don't know you might send it he might delete it you might send it he might listen to it and that might light a spark in his heart and as a result of that five years down the line he might be the best of us and so ikhwani fillah this disconnect you guys need to help us with it. You guys need to help us with it. Because preaching to the converted is fine. It's great. It's easy. But it's not gonna it's not gonna increase and bring more brothers and sisters into you know the, the correct uh, circle. Barakallah Um so that was the issue. Nobody was saying anything in terms of uh, an important issue, but I think that's a major issue. And what really frustrates me is when the local uh, imams they are speaking in a language which uh, the youth don't understand. Yani, subhanallah, one of the masajids where I give the khutbah, you know, one week it's in Urdu. And I'm sat there and I'm thinking, you know, 
<laughs> well, when, when I say I'm sat there, I'm usually not sat there. Um, but um, once every two months, I have one khutbah free. So every Friday, I'm doing a khutbah somewhere. Uh, and then once every two months, and one Friday, I get one Friday off, or I take one Friday off, and I'm not doing the khutbah anywhere. And that khutbah, sometimes I go to certain masajid, and I'm sat there, and the imam speaking in Urdu. And I can understand Urdu, but the point is, is I look around, and we have our Somali brothers, they don't understand Urdu. We have our Bengali brothers, they don't understand Urdu. We have our uh, young uh, Young brothers, even if they're Pakistani, they don't understand Urdu. We have our revert brothers, maybe, uh, you know, English brothers, French brothers. And I'm sat there thinking this is the one time in a week where you have these people for half an hour and you speak in a language that they can't understand. It's a calamity. It's a calamity. And if this is happening at your masjid, you need to stand up and you need to say to them, come on, uncles, please let somebody speak in English who the people understand. Um, the issue now I want to speak about is sisters working, okay? Number one, Ikhwani Fillah, when it comes to sisters working, I want to make it really, really clear at the beginning. I recognize that there are sisters who need to work. You need to work, why? Because you have bills to pay, let's say you don't have any brothers, your father, let's say he he's passed away or he is no longer with your mother, and your mother's job is not sufficient to pay the bills, uh, so you've got bills to pay. Or you're a revert living alone, so you've got bills to pay. And these bills that we 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 have we live in a practical world. I can't sit here and say now, sisters, you need to be at home raising the kids, because if you don't have food on the table, how are you going to raise the kids? Okay. So that's the first thing. That there are situations where our sisters have to work, don't want to work, but have to work. Okay, and so we recognize those situations. What's the advice to those sisters now? You, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fattakullah mastata'atum. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. Okay, so now if I've got a sister, or if a sister approaches me and she, and she says, Look, if I don't work, I don't eat. If I don't work, my bills don't get paid. I'm living off the dole and that's not enough for me. I'm going to have to start using food banks, etc., etc. I am now not going to say to her sister, the only place you can work is an Islamic bookshop. It's not realistic. How many Islamic bookshops do you know in, in reality? And the, and, and the crazy ironic thing is most of the Islamic bookshops, they're not very Islamic when it comes to paying their employees and paying them the minimum wage and these types of things. That just give them three pound, four pound an hour, pay them when they, when they have any money. And it's just an absolute shambles. So what, what, what then should we speak, say to our sisters? We say, sister, fear Allah to the best of your ability. If you can find a job, and that job, it minimizes the haram, it minimizes uh, you know, the, 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 the doubtful matters, walhamdulillah. But ultimately, if you're in a situation where if you don't get a job, you're not going to eat, what should we then say? Sister, go hungry. Sister, go hungry. Just feed yourself on subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. And yani this is not practical and there are sisters in this situation and and you know whenever i uh, whenever i criticize sisters i'm you know people think i'm i'm just a woman hater and i'm speaking about all the sisters no i recognize that there's sisters in these situations and my words don't apply to them to every single thing that i ever write there's always an exception to that because for every rule there's always an exception ikhwani fillah so you have to just use common sense read what i'm saying and just be people of common sense don't be smart, Alex, trying to find, you know, pick holes in what people say. In any case, what our sisters need to then do is, is, is do their best. Okay? And this is where I believe it's important for a sister living in the West to be educated. To have an element of skill that she can use if, for, for a, in a rainy day. That's what I believe. Wallahi, I believe that our sisters... You shouldn't just be living off your husband and if your husband passes away or if your husband leaves you, khalas, you're left in the lurch, you've got nothing to be able to fall back on. There needs to be a contingency plan because we're living in very unforgiving times and we don't want our sisters out on the street. We don't want our sisters starving. We don't want our sisters to have to put their hands out and say, feed me, feed me. We don't want our, that for our sisters.
okay and so I believe that the sisters the women folk you should have a level of education a level of skill something that you can call on uh, something that you can do and this is not for me to be your careers advisor but something that you need uh, to have in order to be able to call upon so that should you know should it, the uh, situation arise if however ikhwani fillah the sister has no need to work then i believe that it's better for the woman to stay at home to raise those children likewise for the sisters who are even if you're not married it's better for you not to um not not to work and that gives you an amazing opportunity to uh, seek knowledge to increase in your level of understanding of the deen etc etc and i believe that that is uh, the way that it should be what i don't support and i'll say this again what i don't support our sisters uh, working and becoming uh, you know the at the absolute peak in their field and not getting married i don't have a any problem with a sister earning a lot of money and becoming a specialist in fact i think it's excellent as long as they're holding down their home duties as long as she's a wife as long as she's a mother as long as she's a daughter and she's doing all of this and if she can fit in a job and st and and still be amazing and reach the peak alhamdulillah we say sister all the power to you you know and all the success to you as long as it's obviously halal and she's not compromising the sharia and not compromising a hijab and free mix you know shaking hands and all of these types of things alhamdulillah and 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 we need high flying sisters like this okay sisters who maybe your children have grown up they require less uh, of your time etc but you know what to have sisters who are 40 45 not married and then when then they complain and say brother i can't get married why can't you get married because the brothers who want to get married they want to marry somebody younger they they don't want to marry somebody with the greatest of respect who is that old subhanallah and you know they want to have children etc your your biological clock in inverted commas is 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 ticking very quickly and so these things you guys need to consider you're going to reach the peak in a certain field you're going to have children and then you're going to come and you're going to be a stay at home mother okay if your skills are transferable you know alhamdulillah we need muslim nurses we need muslim midwives we need muslim doctors like i said every person has to do what he is within his ability or she has within her ability within the sharia and at the same time we affirm that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us that whoever you know whichever woman she uh, you know she believes in allah etc she fasts she prays her five daily prayers she obeys her husband and uh, she guards her chastity then she will be told on yawm qiyamah enter through any of the eight gates of jannah that you wish sisters the bottom line is this the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't speak about having millions of pounds didn't speak about you know reaching the the the, the peaks in terms of your career etc there's no problem with that but ultimately that's not going to benefit you when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tomorrow what's really going to benefit you is being a uh, righteous wife what's really going to benefit you is being a good mother is raising your children upon the deen with good manners good etiquettes etc that's what's really going to benefit you so don't lose sight of it but then at the same time we need to know that there are sisters who are business women and sisters who you know mashallah rolling around in lots and lots of money and there's no harm in that and we say yes alhamdulillah that's excellent and in fact often the sisters when it comes to charity they are more charitable than you tight brothers you brothers many of you are really tight and our sisters many of them are really generous and that's because they're rich mashallah tabarakallah and remember that the wealth that the woman has is hers okay the man he has to pay for the wife he has to maintain his wife her her, her, her living etc he has to deal with all of that as for the uh, woman you make a million you keep a million you buy as many handbags as you like okay uh, and so we want sisters to just remember the bigger picture barakallah fikum. okay um anything else that you want to um address Any more um, issues, Ikhwani Fillah? Okay, so uh, the brother asks, is it obligatory to pray father prayer in the masjid? Yes, it is. 
uh, if you live in the vicinity of the masjid. Uh, the next question, okay, is this issue of marriage? Uh, sisters are divorced, sisters, uh, uh, you know, a widow, sister is slightly older, she's not married, it's a, she hasn't been married, etc. This is a two-way street, okay, this is a two-way street and I want to be delicate with the way that I deal with this, inshallah. Um, this is a two-way street because the sisters, number one, need to be realistic in their um, in their expectations, okay? And some of our sisters who have not been married for many, many years is because they are looking for perfection. Or they are looking for some man who's going to come along and is going to be like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. And so those sisters will be waiting till Qiyam. And she'll be in her grave and her bones will have disintegrated and she's still waiting. Okay? Munkar and Nakir have come and they've visited her and she's still waiting. Okay? And Yom Qiyamah is established and she's still waiting. Because there's only one Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. And as for us jokers, we're nothing like him nor we're nothing like any of the companions or any of the prophets and any of the messengers. We're full of weaknesses. So sisters need to be realistic and that's my advice to sisters. If a brother comes and he has good deen and he has a good character and he is somebody who can maintain you uh, both financially, um, spiritually and physically and this is a problem now because most of you men are one minute men unfortunately but in any case he can maintain you in all of those ways then hamd, you should proceed and you shouldn't look too much and you shouldn't look for uh, things which are unrealistic okay and that's extremely important so we have to get that out of the way the second thing that I want to um, mention ikhwani fillah is that marriage has become really difficult in our times yani we complicate marriage so much and when we look at marriage in the community of those companions at the time of the Prophet sallallahu we see that marriage and divorce were things which were done for the sake of the akhirah. And so if a woman, she was widowed or she was divorced or she was, uh, you know, she had been in a relationship, meaning she'd previously been married. The companions had no, uh, they had no qualms with marrying that woman because they married for the akhirah. They married for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our issue is that we marry for the dunya. When you marry for the dunya, there's no barakah, it's difficult, it's tricky, problems, arguments, and these types of things. And I'm going to say from experience as well, that a sister who is older and more mature, she is more valuable in today's day than a sister who is young and immature. You get sisters who are young and still mature, alhamdulillah. But a sister who is older and she is more mature, she's calmer, she's more, got more uh, knowledge of how the world works and she's not so naive and she's seen the world and experienced the world, this is a valuable woman because this is a woman who's realistic in her expectations. As for the sister who is young and immature, she's going to want Abu Bakr radiallahu anh. And when you fall flat on your face, not getting anywhere near him, she is likely going to cause you problems. And as men, you and I'm, and I'm advising you as a man and as your brother in Al-Islam, you don't want a wife that's going to do your head in. You want a wife who you can help her and she can help you, okay? And a righteous wife who helps you in your deen, helps you in your dunya, is more uh, more valuable than this world and everything that it contains. It's the best of the blessings from this world. To have a companion, somebody who's going to help you, somebody who's got your back, you've got their back. Alhamdulillah. Brothers, we need to start marrying sisters who have been in difficult situations sisters who may potentially have been abused in the past sisters who uh, they've been uh, you know married and they may have children but the problem is we have to be realistic again i always try and be practical with you people because you know what the sister now she is married she's you know she's divorced she's got a child her ex 
the father of that child is constantly going to be in your life. You're going to have to arrange with him when can he see his child, when can he pick his child up, how long, etc., etc. Or you might be in a difficult, you know, the, the, the nightmare situation where the woman and her ex, they're still in contact, etc. And so it's difficult from, from a man's perspective. It's also difficult because, uh, Yanni, you know, as your, as your first marriage, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend it. But then again, this is where sisters don't want to be involved. They don't want to be a second, you know, terms and conditions apply here, law and all of that type of stuff. If it's legal, please check the laws where you are. Um, you know, the, the sisters don't want to be in a, a man's second wife. The sisters don't want to be in a polygynous relationship. They don't want to be one of his uh, multiple wives. And so it's a difficult, that's why I said, it's a two-way street. That sister, you have to recognize if you've been married and you've got children, etc., it's not so easy. The man has to think about lots of things. He's not only got to cater for you, he's got to bring up your children as well. He's got to be a father to your children as well. And at the same time, you know, the, 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 the father of your children, meaning your ex, he's going to be constantly there as well. So from a brother's perspective, there's a lot of things that you've got to think about. Can I deal with it? Can I handle his involvement? Can I handle those kids? Am I going to be able to raise those children, etc., etc.? So I wouldn't criticize the brothers and say and write them off and say you're all write-offs because you don't but, but there's a two-way street there's a two-way street and so that's why we need flexibility from both the brothers and we need flexibility from the sisters as well but when the sister if she gets divorced and she has children it becomes very very difficult for her and that's where i believe that we as brothers we should come together and help our sisters even if it's just financially and help them with some money help them out wherever we can and don't make our sisters, you know, need to uh, go and beg. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I may be miles off with that advice, but that's just what I feel. Barakallahu feekum. Anything else? If only for Allah. Um, okay. Let's talk about this issue of not being able to have children, okay? Um, look, when it comes to the issue of um, not being able to have children, I think that we have to see, number one, that it's not the fault of the woman, subhanAllah. You know, traditionally and culturally, some cultures, they look at the woman and they, uh, they, um, they blame it on the woman. Life and death is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yuhyi wa yumi. He's the one who gives life and he's the one that gives death. And I've known of multiple situations where people have been told that they can't have children or they've been married for many, many years. Brothers, number one, don't ever make your wife feel like she's a failure. Don't ever make your wife feel like she is uh, less or low because she hasn't, you know, uh, become pregnant. This is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, I think that um, we should uh, look into the halal means of treatment and these types of things. And I think that that is something which should be looked at. And the third thing, okay, um, from, a, um, from a sister's perspective, men, you've got to see that the woman is going to be under an immense amount of pressure. As every month passes by, every year passes by, that sister is going to be feeling the weight of her shoulders on you, on the weight on her of the world on her shoulders. You have to be somebody who you have to speak to, and say, "Listen, I'm here with you. Don't worry, we'll get through this." And make du'a and these types of things. Wallahi, the best thing that you can do is make du'a. The best thing that you can do is make du'a. Go and make du'a. Pray together. And, and, and wake up in the last third of the night, do the treatments that are permissible, go and make that dua, and just wait, and just wait, and just wait, and just wait, okay? So brothers, you've got to support your wives, okay? Wives, you've also got to support your brothers, as, uh, your husbands as well. Why? Because the husband, he wants offspring. He wants someone to take his lineage forward. He wants somebody to inherit from him. He wants somebody who... 
uh, you know, when he dies, he's going to make dua for him. When you die, he's going to make dua for you. So the husband is also going to be under this pressure. Maybe the husband's family, his mother in particular, his sisters, they're the ones that like to talk. Maybe they're the ones, they're putting pressure on him. Look, why don't you get rid of her? She's not blessing, you know, she's not giving you a child, etc. This is, this is jahl, this is ignorance in reality, okay? I know couples have been married for 15, 20 years, no kids. After 20 years, Allah blesses them with a child. Two years later, she gets pregnant again and Allah blesses them with another child. This is in the hands of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Don't ever think that me and you control it. Don't ever think that me and you control it. Whatever Allah has decreed, He has decreed. Okay? But again, this is where a sister needs to weigh up now. Okay? Because we find some situations where a brother, he wants kids and his wife, uh, she hasn't, you know, she's not able to have kids for argument's sake. And so the husband now, he says, look, I want to get married again because I want to have children. I'm getting older, you're getting older, etc. And the wife, she, uh, she doesn't accept that. And so she ends up divorced and he marries again anyway. And so you're thinking, sister, look, subhanAllah, you lost. Uh, yani, wasn't it better to be his wife? And for him to have another wife, but at least you've got a roof over your head and at least he's providing for you. At least you've got that companionship and at least he's protecting you, etc. If he's doing it properly, of course. All of these things, and again, terms and conditions apply. Isn't, yeah, and wasn't that better for you than now going back at your mom's and you're now 35 years old? I just wish that as people, brothers and sisters, we'd look at the bigger picture. Just step back a second and just think a bit long term rather than just constantly being full of emotion and being really immature in our thought. I wish that we would just uh, think long term and that would be better for us in reality. And so this issue of infertility, yes, it's a very real issue. This issue of, uh, you know, I haven't had kids and these types of things. And, and, and subhanAllah, you know, there's people who the doctors say you're both fine. Medically, you're both fine. But. You just haven't been blessed with a child. And I'm not going to turn around now and say, oh, it's all Rukia related and these types of things. But you may want that. And I know that they're from the, amongst the sisters that they, there are apparently cupping points for fertility and these types of things. So you may want to contact a you know qualified practitioner of hijama and, and speak to her about uh, you know fertility points and cupping and that type of thing. And that might benefit you, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And I know there are sisters out there who do that. So... Again, uh, the life is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, this issue, Allah musta'ala, okay, the issue of child abuse, okay, how do we, how do we behave and how, um, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And your Lord has decreed that you don't worship anybody but him and to the parents good treatment okay Allah says that if one or, or two of them reaches old age فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ don't even say أُفْ to them وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّ يَعْنِي صَغِيرًا say to them say oh my lord have mercy upon them the way they had mercy upon me when I was younger Lower to them the wing of your mercy. And other than that, my, my khutbah, ironically, on Friday was about good, uh, you know, goodness to parents. But the point is, uh, brothers and sisters, there are some parents, namely the fathers, who abuse their daughters. And they abuse, they sexually abuse their daughters. It's hard to speak about Wallahi when you think about it that the father he sexually abuses his own daughter yani, uh, what, what do you say you know is there not amongst you is there not from amongst you yani, uh, a person who's just decent Lut alayhi salatu salam. He said to those people who wanted to in the Quran, he said, Look, these are my daughters. Marry them. Fulfill your desires with the women. What Allah has created for you. Isn't there just a decent person amongst you? Isn't there an upright person from amongst you? 
Isn't there a man with intellect? Isn't there a man who's just fair and just, just normal? Isn't there a normal one from amongst you? And yani, subhanAllah, when a man, he's, he, if you were to ask a daughter, who is the one that would protect you against anything and everything? She'd say, my father. Forget my husband, my father. More than anyone else, my father will protect me. And then that father goes and he sexually abuses you. Allah understand. You know, what will be the situation of this person on Yom Al-Qiyamah? That Allah gave him this trust. And he gave him this position. And he came and he abused this position. And he abused his own daughter. This innocent soul. This young soul, this helpless soul, and he abused her and he ruined her. How Allah wa ta'ala is not forgetful, ikhwani fillah. Allah wa ta'ala is al adl. He is the He is the one with perfect justice. And subhanAllah, do you not think that Allah wa ta'ala didn't see that? He didn't know that? You might forget. Allah won't forget. And so what's the situation now with regards to does this person now have to be how does this person react and interact with this man who has abused them? Ikhwani, firstly I want to say that there's no excuse Islamically to disrespect your parents. Islamically there is no excuse and it is never acceptable to be rude and curse your parents in fact the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that allah and imam al-bukhari brings this in al-adab al-mufrad and it is sahih that allah curses the one who curses his parents allah curses the one who curses his parents so we have no excuse to be horrible and to curse them Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, his father was the one who built the idols and the people used to worship those idols after he had built them. And he said to Ibrahim, Oh Ibrahim, if you don't stop this call of yours, I'm going to stone you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stone you to death, basically. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam still spoke words of kindness, words of mercy, words of respect towards his father. There's no sin greater than shirk, okay? There's no sin greater than shirk. And his father was calling him to shirk. Abuse is unspeakably bad, but it's not bigger than shirk. And Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, his father was calling him and telling him to commit shirk. And yet he didn't disrespect his father. So me and you, no matter what, we can't disrespect our fathers. As for, however, again, being practical, what should your relationship be? Keep your relationship, if you're able to take it further than this, walhamdulillah. If not, keep it to salam and dua. That's it. Salam, how are you? And that's it. You don't need to be alone with that person if it's bringing back crazy memories and, it, and, and it's causing flashbacks and it's causing you psychological pain and harm and it's bringing back, you know... Uh, you know, flashbacks of what's happening. You don't need to be alone with that individual. If that person uh, apologizes to you, you can accept their apology. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to then have a normal father-daughter relationship. The father comes, he kisses his daughter, etc. You don't need to allow that, okay? You don't need to allow that because this was a person who severed that when he did what he did. But you still, like I said, can't disrespect him and you can't curse him and these types of things. Just for the sake of Allah, give this person salam, ask him how he is. You don't care how he is. But for the sake of Allah, oh Allah, I'm asking him how he is for your sake. Because you told me to be good to my parents. So, oh Allah, bear witness that I'm saying this for you. How are you, dad? Khalas, that's it. And just leave it at that. Be practical, please, barakallah people, but don't disrespect them. Don't disrespect them and don't curse them. And so sad is the situation that we have to speak about these things. 
and you guys would be amazed at how prevalent it is amongst our society. You guys would be amazed at how prevalent it is in our society. Okay? It's a serious, serious issue. The custody of the kids now. Somebody said the custody of the kids when the uh, woman remarries. So a man and a woman, they have um, married, they have children, they get divorced, etc. Wallahi, this is a serious issue. Because with divorce rate now, and I don't know when my time will be up, um, it should be coming up soon. With the divorce, and, and so if it come, if my time ends, then I will just go end this, save it and put it, uh, start another one straight away, inshallah. I think it's about five minutes. When a couple divorce Ikhwani Fillah and they have children, the children, as long as they are young, and the mother, you know, whether she's breastfeeding them or they're under the age of seven or the under the age of ten or under the age of puberty. And there's difference of opinion among scholars on this issue. So that's why I've given you the different ages. Some say seven, some say ten, some say the age of puberty, whenever that may be. Others say uh, when the child is at an age where they can discern, they can make a valuable judgment. Do I want to live with mom or do I want to live with dad, etc.? If the man and the so the the woman the default state is the woman she gets the kids if they're up in that situation until they reach that situation where they're able to decide and they're able to uh, you know make that judgment etc. Okay, that's the default state that the children they go with the mother. Uh, it's mentioned in uh, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah taala brings it in Bulugh al Maram. Um, that there's uh, the hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it's recorded in other in books of hadith. That there's a woman, and she comes and she says to the Messenger of Allah, "Oh Messenger of Allah, you know this is my child. I gave birth to him. I suckled him, and now you know my uh, my my his father is trying to take him off me." So the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said words to the effect of that uh, he will go with you so long as you do not remarry. This is the condition now. As long as you don't remarry. If a woman remarries, then the custody of the child goes to the father. If a woman, she the, they have a divorce, the children go with the woman. And they will be raised with the woman until she can decide. Okay, But if that woman remarries, then the custody of those children passes to the father. But if the woman, for example, is breastfeeding those children, then then she or that child, she will continue to breastfeed that child up to a point, uh, up to such point where it can then pass safely onto the child. Likewise, some of the scholars they mention that the uh, the daughter she has. Uh, yeah, I need more need to go to the father because he's the one that's going to protect her. He'll be her wali for marriage, etc. So again, it's a messy situation. But I have some words to say on this ikhwani fillah again from a practical perspective. There are women who, when a uh, marriage it ends in uh, divorce, they use the child to get to the father. Okay, so the woman, she knows we live in the West. The father can't go now and just take his child, etc. Okay, so, you know, she gets a, a, a restraining order. You can't come within so many meters of this property, etc. If you do, you'll end up in prison. And again, this law, it favors the mother in, in a way which is not fair. Okay, so they then use the child as a tool to get to the father. And, and, and this is specifically to those sisters. What I want you to know, my dear sisters, is you did not create that child in your stomach, in your womb. That child is a mix of you and your husband, you or the, and its father. Okay, and the 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 in reality, Subhanallah. Okay, many of our sisters they use the kids as a weapon, and they prevent their fathers from see the, the fathers of the children from seeing those children, or they make it hard. You need to know, my dear sisters, that this is oppression, and this is oppression of the highest degree. You're not, you know, keeping 
that you've not taken somebody's land, you've not taken somebody's food, you've not taken somebody's parking space which belonged to them, you've not you know, picked up uh, somebody's pen from the floor or so there was some money on the floor and you picked it up and it didn't belong to you. This is oppression of varying degrees. You have kept a man from his child. You know, you can keep a man from his food and he'll get angry. But you keep a man from his child, subhanAllah. This is a different level, okay? And sisters, what you are literally doing is you're literally playing with the fire of Jahannam. You are literally playing with the fire of Jahannam. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us and told us about a woman who entered into the fire because she kept a cat away from its food. She took a cat and caged it and kept the cat away from its food. And as a result of that oppression on the cat, keeping the cat from the food, she entered into the fire of Jahannam. And what about the woman who doesn't keep a cat from food, she keeps a man from his children. And so you have to fear Allah. If Allah's given you that you know, that role of and, and responsibility that the children are with you, then subhanAllah, you've got to be scared. You've got to be scared that you don't oppress the other person by means of your uh, position. And so sisters, you know, more to you than to the brothers, you have to fear Allah with this regard. And as for you brothers, don't be bums who have kids and then you don't provide for your kids. Don't be like the animals, you know, just planting your seed in every single place. And then when you have your kids, you forget about them. And then you move on like the donkey to the next uh, woman and you have kids with her. And then you don't see your kids and you don't provide for your kids and you don't nurture your kids. Subhanallah. You, then, you're, then you're just like kal an'ami balhum adal. You're like the cattle, no, even more astray. Um, Ikhwani Fillah, I think my time is literally about to end, so we'll call it a day there as it's very late. Um, I ask Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, first and foremost, that He rectifies our affairs. And I ask Allah, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, that um, He protects us from all evil from amongst the jinn and also from amongst mankind. And I ask Allah, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, uh, for his love. Allahumma inna nas'aluka hubbak wa hubba man yuhibbuk wa hubba amalin yuqarribuna ila hubbik. Oh Allah, we ask you for your love and the love of uh, that those who you love and to make the deeds which you love beloved to us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he doesn't take our souls except when he is pleased with us. And I ask Allah that he makes the last of our deeds the best of our deeds and he forgives us for all of our sins from the first of them to the last of them from the minor to the major those that we committed in open and those that we committed in secret and those that we did knowingly and those that we did unknowingly hadha wa sallallahu ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in until we meet again assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh